Thanks so much, Lorraine. Really appreciate that. So um, I've had the pleasure of watching the other messages uh, that you've been having in the series of Living Life Well, uh, and particularly appreciated Sam last week uh, talking about living with passion. So now it's as if we're ratcheting it up even further uh, from passion, we now talk about living life on the edge. Kind of sounds risky, doesn't it? It brings to mind walking along the edge of a cliff or the metaphor I often feel like I'm in my own life is being out on the, uh, you know, a branch limb and just about to fall off because I'm out there by myself. Um, we've heard this morning uh, from Lorraine, uh, Jesus' teaching about that storing up treasures on earth is kind of useless, even counterproductive. Instead, he teaches us to store up our treasures in heaven. So this isn't a teaching that sounds like an exhortation to take up bungee jumping or deep sea diving or something, but it does sound like Jesus might uh, include a few moves in our lives that might look unwise in our own life uh, or for, like to ourselves or to people in the world as they watch. So this morning we're going to look at some more of Jesus' teaching some heroes of the faith and the importance of believers who discern with them and how we might be, live on the edge but still connected to our community of faith. So let's have a look at the calendar. This time last year I was ministering overseas on deployment in the Middle East uh, and so it was, there was a... Um, a broad group of Christians from all sorts of different Christian traditions that we would have in Australia as um, part of our chapel community. So I decided to follow the mainline church's Bible readings and prayers uh, because that gives familiarity to those Christians who follow the Christian calendar. So this Sunday last year, we were celebrating All Saints Day. Uh, that was a new experience for me. Uh, and it's a day that, where we remember martyrs and saints and Christians who've gone before us, often having uh, suffered for their adherence to the Christian faith. For many Protestant Christians, October 31st is a great day to remember, not just because of the sacrifices of those uh, many martyrs, but it's a turning point. Uh, when a few bold believers, particularly Martin Luther, who according to, we, the reason we get this date is according to a guy called Philip Melanchthon, this is the date he nailed the 95 Thesis to the church door. The event was probably less dramatic than we like to imagine, more like putting up a piece of paper on a notice board than a declaration of independence. But still, I think it was a sliding doors moment uh, that appears to set the church off in a new era of scholarship and discipleship. The next few years was marked by incredibly high stakes church conflict, politics and splits. These Christians who fervently believed in scripture, they, as they read it, they believed it pointed out a far more individualised picture of salvation. So while they loved the church, they felt that they no, could no longer stay within the Roman Catholic tradition and they made their move. This move was dangerous financially, politically and physically. The church literally employed mercenary soldiers. It also takes a great combination of faith and confidence to say to a lineage of hundreds of years of church tradition, you are wrong to say, I have prayed, studied and discerned and I know a better way. Luther was a biblical scholar in a system that both loved the scripture but also loved the many generations of church interpretation. So he was struck by many Bible verses but including John 5.39, which reads, you study the scriptures diligently because you think in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Of course, these were Jesus' words to the Pharisees. And in them, Luther saw the application for the state of faith in his time. 
that the scriptures should point people to a life-saving relationship with Jesus. I want to read you his remarks in English. Uh, he said, he who would correctly and profitably read scriptures should see to it that he finds Christ and in them he finds eternal life without fail. On the other hand, if I do not so study and understand Moses and the prophets as defined that Christ came from heaven for the sake of my salvation, became man, suffered, died, was buried, rose and ascended into heaven, so that through him I might enjoy reconciliation with God, forgiveness of all my sins, grace, righteousness and eternal life, then my reading of scripture is of no help whatsoever to my salvation. Luther's urging that we dive into the scriptures to know and be saved through our relationship with Jesus was a message that the world really needed to hear. And it still does, of course. With that said, the hero of the Reformation for me, um, you know, the Re uh, Reformation that was sparked in Wittenberg in Germany was not so much Luther. Uh, for me, his level of confidence in chutzpah is a complete anathema. I don't understand it. For me, it's Philip Melanchthon. He's this, uh, you know, he's a figure at the same time, literally teaching in the same university. His house is just down the road. But he's a bit quieter. He's an older scholar and he backs up Luther. He's constantly supporting him, advising him and even chastising him. He put his steady scholarly reputation on the line to ensure Luther got the hearing that he needed. Sometimes I apologise, I can picture him apologising for Luther's very um, matter-of-fact approach to conversations and he's coming up uh, smoothing over in a diplomatic way. Anyway, these men, together with the priests, nuns and citizens who joined them, led a movement that changed the world, giving us, for better and for worse, the passionate variety of scholarship, worship and church organisation that we know today. So from these Christian leaders, we can be inspired by, I think, two elements of living on the edge for Jesus. From Luther, I think we learn the importance of studying scripture and explaining it and doing what it says. From Melanchthon, we see a ex great example of, that we can use our influence, whatever it might be, in the church or in the world, to ensure that others get the hearing that they need. If we think it's useful, I think it's useful to be inspired, of course, but then to think about, well, what's the so what? What would that look like in, in my community? Uh, some thoughts that I have on that is it could be advocating or arguing for the place of Christian ministry, such as chaplaincy in our institutions or in our communities. It could be supporting initiatives or, dare I say, experiments in engaging with the community, right where you are, of course, in the northern suburbs of Melbourne. It could mean making space for younger people to serve, accepting that they might do it differently. Once we start using whatever little tiny piece of influence that we have to sort of sponsor others, uh, once we get a feel for it, we feel its rewards, we feel what it can do, and it can encourage us to keep on uh, going and seeing what else we can do uh, to release others as they minister. Well, from uh, the 1500s, I want to turn even further back to some role models of living on the edge, uh, those we call the disciples. <laughs> Um, and we read about the scrappy group of disciples taking financial, social and physical risks, the original disciples, as you like. In Luke chapter 8, we read this. Soon afterwards, Jesus began to tour the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. He took his 12 disciples with him, along with some women who had been cured by evil spirits and diseases. Among them were Mary Magdalene, who, from whom he had cast out seven demons, Joanna, 
the wife of Shuza, Herod's business manager, Susanna, and many others who are contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. The reality that the 12 male disciples of Jesus took risks, social and economic, to follow Jesus is, I think, really well known to us. We, we know the story of, of these 12. What might catch our breath as we think about the jo Jewish and the Roman world in the first century is Luke's account of Jesus' female disciples. These disciples were women who had been healed by Jesus and subsequently followed him, providing for Jesus and the disciples out of their own financial means. Whenever I read this account, I am stunned. Leaving behind the security and identity of the home, a place a culture said that they as the weaker ones were best suited, and instead of following Jesus and enabling his mission. I can't help but wonder if the male disciples were sceptical at first of Jesus' welcome of these women and how long it took for them to admire and defend their place in learning from Jesus and supporting the mission of the good news being told. Jesus affirmed the sacrifice and dedication of his disciples in Matthew chapter 12, where he called them true family. Let's look at that reading. As Jesus was speaking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside asking to speak to them, him. Someone told Jesus, your mother and brothers are standing outside and they want to speak to you. Jesus asked, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he pointed to his disciples and said, look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. In leaving the stability, comfort and identity of the family groups in Galilee and following Jesus, the disciples had become Jesus' true, we might say, spiritual family. So we understand that it's not just the chosen 12, but rather a broader group of followers. There's a, a scholar called uh, Ken Bailey. I have yeah, his book, one of his books on my shelf just here. And uh, he points this out about this passage. He writes, in our Middle Eastern cultural context, a speaker who gestures to a crowd of men and say, here is my brother and uncle and cousin. He can't say, here is my brother and sister and mother. So this text, Matthew 12, affirms that Jesus is gesturing to his disciples when uh, he addresses them with male and female terms. This communicates to the reader that the disciples before him were composed of men and women. Even though we know that the 12 are a broad group, I think we can be encouraged, and I know I personally am, of Jesus' affirmation of the inclusion of a bigger and more diverse group of disciples as his true family, as he points out the truth of the Jesus' kingdom. Discipleship that pleases Jesus is not confined to a narrow group of people, particular demographic or a place that they come from or who they're married to. It includes the many people who choose to follow him. Once again, I see two sets of Christian role models here. First, the women who risk a lot, including disapproval or even being cut off from their biological family and friends to do a radical thing of following Jesus and providing for his mission. The next admirable group of believers are the men who backed them up, the disciples who accepted, sponsored and protected their inclusion in Jesus' family. We can be encouraged by these women and men, I think, to be open minded about what an appropriate life looks like as we follow Jesus. Maybe following Jesus means not having everything that our peers do, whether it's owning a car or a house, marrying or having an acceptable number of children. God calls us to prioritise following him first. Some of the usual trappings of the extra Australian experience might not 
uh, fit into the life that God is calling us to. Conversely, we maybe we will have a so-called normal looking life and we can demonstrate our courage and discipleship by giving support to those Christians who do not have room for these things. That could mean, say, financial support to missionaries or social inclusion to the increasing number of Australians who don't have a nuclear family. So I'd like us to turn now to the a rather important question, I think, in the metaphor of the edge, which is how we keep from falling off. A characteristic of Christian churches and especially pronounced in our faith traditions is the priesthood of all believers. From the tearing of the curtain in the temple, top to bottom, to the disciples' prayer for discernment of leaders to add to their number, the gift of the Holy Spirit to all, it counterintuitively perhaps makes us not lone rangers in our faith, but rather connected to each other as we discern what God wants. This is the tether that allows us to go to the edge without falling over the edge. There's some examples worth touching on. If we did all of them, we'd be here all morning. I won't do that. But let's just skip along in the, in the beginning of Acts. So in Acts, um, so the disciples prayed as they waited for the Holy Spirit. We read this in Acts 1 where we read, they all met together and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary and the mother of Jesus, several other women and the brothers of Jesus. The believers prayed and they acted accordingly. So in Acts 4, we read, all the believers were united in heart and mind and they felt that, that, that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's great blessing was upon them all. And the leaders of the church prayed before giving advice and instruction uh, thank goodness they did because these instructions would go on to be incredibly pivotal for the church for generations to come. Uh, they begin their instruction and advice in Acts 15 with these words. Uh, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. All these moments meant making decisions, arguably risky decisions together through prayer, the power of the Holy Spirit, and confirming that dis the discernment happened between other believers. Through prayer, discussion, and sometimes small practice and experiments, our fellow believers usually gather together in our home congregation or gather together on Zoom, help us to hear from God, to discern wisely, and to take the risks that we need to. The great gift of our fellow believers, although at times it is painful, is that of accountability. As we venture forth, fellow believers can continue to test our efforts, are always connected to God's purposes and not to self-advancement or to license. Martin Luther, while clearly the leader, still had his ideas, direction and safety tested. Is there any greater act of love than plucking someone out of an argument that's about to become a fight and leaving them in a castle annex for their own safety? Joanna and the other female disciples of Jesus probably had their motives and their behaviour tested and monitored. It probably felt like a real trial. But the male disciples' discussion and accountability would have given the women much greater safety and social protection. For me, I suppose that my ministry is on the edge. Not because it's particularly dangerous, but because it could become easy to become untethered from other believers and their accountability. Now in my third posting in five years, uh, as well as I mentioned, having spent a significant period of time in training and in deployment. So in each new place, it's important that I find a new church and ask them to keep track of me, to know what I'm doing, for, for me to 
email them and explain when I've, I've suddenly gone missing and when I'll be back and, and how I'm continuing to worship and to, to follow Jesus in the new place. I have to tell my mentor and my Queensland faith community what I'm doing and it probably reads like missionary newsletters. But I think it's important. We know people who've attempted great things for God and somehow lost their way, perhaps in temptation, a loss of focus, or just the everyday business and busyness of life. But conversely, we all know that some of us were probably too quick to close our minds to what God was calling us to do, that the calling was just a little bit too far out of the box of our own lived experience. So as I conclude, and I will conclude in just a moment, I'm not here to lay guilt. I'm not going to call for a revolution. I suspect those of us this morning who count ourselves as followers of Jesus do want to study the word and to do what it says. We want to sponsor others in ministry and we want to discern together. But I also suspect, in fact, I'm convicted that for almost all of us, God has more he wants to do in each of these areas. There's deeper, there's tougher, and there's more adventure to come. So, as is the most wonderful tradition of this church, we have the opportunity now to, to ask some questions of ourselves. I've framed them uh, in the first person acknowledging that we all need to ask these questions of ourselves. Let us ask, as I read God's word, what convicts me? How can I discern with other believers? Who can I sponsor to take their next steps of discipleship?